Welcome, aloha. Thank you so much for joining us on our last official Think Tech Hawaii scheduled session of difficult conversations to make good trouble. And we have the extremely great honor and pleasure of having with us today, for the first time this year, Tina Patterson <clears throat> from Germantown, Maryland, not New Jersey. I haven't done that in a long time, so I'm not gonna make that mistake. <clears throat> Although I did deal with an attorney from New Jersey yesterday. So <clears throat> David Larson from Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota, former head of the American Bar Association Section of Dispute Resolution, preeminent mediator and innovator of court-related online dispute resolution programs, as well as professor at Hamlin School of Law, Mitchell Hamlin. Ben Davis in Charlottesville, Virginia, keeping them on their good behavior for over a year consecutively. Congratulations, Ben, with one of his famous t-shirts. It is what it is. And on the backside, for those of you who can't see, that's what it's going to be. And Jeff Portnoy, our leading First Amendment lawyer, former sports commentator and color commentator, and just general all-around great guy, as well as a partner at one of our largest and most respected law firms. Okay, folks, we can go right into last thoughts, <laughs> but, but we won't. Critical thinking for critical choices. How do we get there? How do we get people to engage in critical thinking about important choices? Tina, ladies first, any ideas? I, I think we're gonna have to go back to the basics and explain what critical thinking really is because often, more often than not, people think critical thinking is something else. Um, and the critical thinking has five components and I'm just gonna read them off. It's observation, analysis, inference, communication, and problem solving. We are now in the 240 character byte world where uh, observation is that 240 characters. The analysis doesn't happen. We are relying on someone else instead of doing it ourselves. The inference is often missed because the analysis has been done by someone else. The communication is truncated and the problem solving, the problem solving is often done by somebody else. We are going to have to go back to the basics and talk about the five elements and what that actually means um, as it relates to misinformation or lack of information, but also thinking for oneself. And it's perfectly fine to not be in alignment with what everyone else is doing. The other common theme we hear is fear of missing out, FOMO. You don't have to miss out on having misinformation. Do the thinking yourself, do the analysis yourself, and come up with your own decision. Wow. Well, that's a heck of a start. Hey, mm. Jeff, thoughts? You beat that. That was too analytical for me. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, we started this, I don't know when I did the first show with you, Chuck, two years ago, whenever. Closer to four. And uh, unfortunately, very little has changed. Uh, you know, we talked about political issues, talked about Trump, talked about the divide in the country, talked about the Supreme Court, and uh, those issues are just as relevant today as they were when we first did our first show. And if there's been any critical thinking, it's only been among us, <laughs> because I don't think there's been very much critical thinking anywhere uh, on any of these issues. I think the country is more divided. I think we face a cataclysmic election in November. Uh, I think the Supreme Court, even as we speak, is grappling with whether Donald Trump can shoot somebody down the street in Fifth Avenue in New York and get away with it under presidential immunity. As we sit here today, as lawyers are cross-examining the publisher of the National Enquirer about how they got paid to kill stories. I mean, it's just deja vu, deja vu, 
deja vu. And uh, it's, unfortunate. it's unfortunate. I mean, we have rioting going on on college campuses. Uh, 51 years ago about the Vietnam War, I was involved in it. This time around, sorry, Ben, I have no idea what's going on with these rallies uh, in favor of Palestinian autonomy. That I can explain, but the other issues are beyond me. Outsiders agitating, kids deciding they don't want to go to school anymore. They don't want to take exams anymore. They just want to sit there and confront the police on, on issues. I understand free speech probably better than anybody. I fought for it for 50 years, but there are certain limitations on it. So all I'm pointing out is there hasn't been much critical thinking. I think I'll end with that. Hey, and among the many excellent points that both of you have brought out, and Jeff's point about the First Amendment now having been turned on its head to be weaponized, hey, as a tool against people personally, violently, not only verbally, but physically violently. And I don't know that we've seen that to this extent, this breadth, this depth, or this level in our lifetimes. David, thoughts? I don't know. First thought is that uh, one of Jeffrey's comments that the Supreme Court is grappling with this idea of presidential immunity and whether somebody can whether a president can shoot somebody and not be prosecuted for it. The fact that they have to grapple with that, <laughs> that is really distressing. That is really disappointing. Um, it's kind of like common sense has gone out the window. Um, that's a little scary. In terms of critical thinking and why it isn't happening and how can we improve it, I think one thing we can talk about is just explain that human nature makes us comfortable with our current beliefs and that sometimes we've got to shake ourselves up a little bit. Um, it's okay to be uncomfortable. Um, it's natural to want to be comfortable. And I think we got to have some conversations about um, that's maybe not the best and most productive place to be in a democratic society, that sometimes you want to be a little bit uncomfortable. Um, maybe a little more discussion about cognitive bias and do it in layman's terms. But the idea is that we're going to favor information that confirms our current beliefs. That's That's what we do as human beings. And we just need to have an awareness of that, that just because we're hearing something that confirms what we already believe doesn't make it a stronger case necessarily. It's just um, we've picked out our media sources um, that we know are going to say the kinds of things with which we agree. And again, we've got to, we've got to encourage people to be a little more open to, to other ideas. So, you know, I think conversations about where we're at and how we're behaving is are really important and to have it at a micro level. I think we need to lean down our schools a little bit to 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 make sure they're they're teaching critical thinking rather than just rote memorization or preparation for standardized exams, which some schools are doing. You know, they want to be able to promote the fact that their students score a certain way on standardized tests, um, maybe a little less on spent time on critical thinking and analysis and evaluation. So uh, I guess I'm, I, I don't want to say I'm hopeless, um, but I'm definitely worried. Uh, and I do think we need to have almost a constant conversation about people pay attention to what's happening and to the degree it makes you uncomfortable, that's okay. Um, but try to listen to some other avenues of information. Um, one thing I'm really worried about the fall is is you know, our deep fakes. The idea that man, our technology is getting so good now. I just saw a report that um, there's one technology where if I get 15 seconds of your voice, I can now create a whole dialogue um, in your voice. I just need 15 seconds, and I can I can have you saying anything. It's going to sound just like you. So this whole idea of deep fakes and how good they are, and the problem of being able to identify what's a deep fake and on uh, the other side, that what I'm presenting to you is not a deep fake. You know, to prove the negative is going to be really hard. How do you prove it's not a deep fake? Um, I think an awareness about that, the, the, the kind of the, the evolution of technology and the sophistication is going to be extremely important. The people have to be aware that 
there is going to be an intent to fool them, to distract them, to give them misinformation and disinformation. And what, be aware that's coming. And you know, look at your sources. Try to confirm that with whatever facts you can, but just know this is happening. And when you see a video and we hear voices, don't necessarily believe that it's that it's accurate or true. Wow. Hey, well, Brother Ben, you teach at Washington and Lee Law School and have Professor Emeritus from University of Toledo Law School and others. Hey, you work with students all the time and you're around faculty all the time and administrators. Hey. And we see that higher education institutions, including graduate institutions, are under direct frontal, verbally violent and professionally violent attack. How do you cultivate and protect critical thinking in that kind of environment when if people engage in it, they can be threatened, they can be subjected to really serious stuff, not just them, but their whole family? Well. Uh, the thought that came to mind, if this is any help, was actually some lyrics from an old song by Buffalo Springfield, for what it's worth, which is that there's something happening here, what it is ain't exactly clear, uh, step out of line and they come and take you away, a couple lines like that. Um, I, you know, the urge to conformism that we're seeing uh, and the pressure for conformism um, is uh, something that uh, you know we're watching even on a on a daily basis. Uh, uh, and so, one of the things that I don't know if I'm the right kind of First Amendment person, Jeff, but I'm just saying that I'm in favor of in these settings not having speech codes at these schools not having uh, uh, having what I, I, I tend to call full contact dialogue. In other words, the kinds of things that we're seeing happening on campuses right now, for me, um, are good things. And I know that there's uh, an effort to uh, do misdirection, if I would say, or to, to reframe them I just saw uh, a a text from uh, Governor Abbott about what was going on at the University of Texas in Austin, where he was saying that, you know, we don't tolerate anti-Semitism, you know, and that's the sort of characterizing the, the kind of debates that are going on in these campuses in that sense. Yet, I know that uh, at Columbia, they actually had a Seder in the encampment, you know, so... You know, holding those two things in my mind at the same time, that there could be vigorous dis disagreement and dialogue with, you know, without violence. I must admit that once you start to see the National Guard show up, some of us older folks start to think, oh, Kent State, Jackson State, and that kind of conformist thing being pushed on us. And I, my personal view is that that is a classic response of institutions, but that institutions really should encourage the flourishing of thought, the flourishing of dialogue, um, uh, rather than trying to cut off this or that type of uh, viewpoint, which at least in the First Amendment stuff that I learned a long time ago, viewpoint discrimination by the state was, was problematic. Um, beyond that, in looking to the comments that uh, others have made here, you know, one of the things that I think is Im maybe important is the idea of uh, enjoying ambiguity. You know, things are not, I don't know, black and white or red and blue. They are ambiguous most of the time, with certain aspects sort of being one way or certain aspects being another. And being able to be comfortable with ambiguity, and in trying to sort out what 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 is what is going on, in um, um, 
I, there, you know, I get, I hear that we're, you know, we're supposed to be in this camp or that camp or something like that, or we're, we're, but I, you know, I, I think that, li- you know, life is complicated. Okay. And, or lots of parts of life are complicated. And, um, as we maybe get older, we recognize that it is more complicated than sort of what we thought. So, um, so when I, you know, going back to the institutions uh, and the students, um, you know, who want to know, well, is this the rule? This is the only rule, you know, and the answer is it depends, <laughs> you know, and, you know, wait a minute. No, it's not supposed to depend. Yeah, well, actually, that a lot of time it does depend as to what, what is the, the appropriate rule in, in, in a certain setting and, uh, and what, and, and there's so many imponderables that are there at the same time so uh getting them comfortable with that and then the duty to try to come up with uh what they think is the best case so to speak um is uh i think part of what education is doing or should do my worry is that we're going through a phase again where we do not we 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 want conformity or conformity by the top conformity the top wants conformity um and um i'm not convinced that the top is so full of knowledge that we need to conform to it uh so so tina you've given us a recipe with five elements nice clean clear ingredients and a sequence right that should be followed it's not like you put in element number five first, the problem solving, before you do any of the first four. So you got to follow both the right ingredients and the right sequence. Uh, where in education, in society, where can we start to do that? I think both David and Ben have touched upon, I think we have opportunity in the educational system, whether it's higher education or at the elementary level, to to talk about observation and analysis, to talk about inference, to talk about the communication and problem solving. For those of us that have have been taught, whether through our academic route or through work, we know what critical thinking skills are. It's now a matter of encouraging that conversation, encouraging that, what do you think? What do you infer from this? What do you believe? And doing, ha- having that conversation of, okay, I saw this, but is it true? Do I know this to be fact? And in some ways, undoing the easy. It's easy. It's easy for me to take what I see on Instagram or X or other channels and, and go along with it versus that just doesn't ring true. I, that just doesn't make sense, but I see the opportunity primarily in our academic um, institutions. And again, when I say academia, I'm talking about elementary school moving forward. Um, I I think the challenges, especially when we talk about academia and we're talking about the higher institutions, in this case, the colleges, law schools, et cetera, is that tension between administration and the instructors. Those instructors who say, I want you to be a viable member of society. And in order to do that, I need you. These are skills that you'll need, whether you are rendering a decision or writing a contract or reading the paper. These are skills that you need and not let me just cut, you know, we'll just rush through this. My thoughts, my two cents. I think, so, unfor- to- but I think unfortunately that's not the situation in no. increasing oh, no. numbers. School school boards have been replaced by governors, legislators, and parents who don't want students engaging in thinking. That's not what they want. They don't want schools to be teaching their children anything that they don't believe should be taught at home. So critical thinking is out the window in so many states right now and so many school districts. It's not like it was decades ago where teachers were given the opportunity to engage their students in critical thinking. Now, more and more parents say, no, that's not the job of education. You can teach my kid how to add two and two, but don't teach my kid about thinking about moral, political, historical 
issues. That's not your job. That's not your job. You can teach my kid to spell, but don't bother and don't even try to teach them about more important issues that may engage them in critical thinking. That's the problem. I agree with you, Jeff, and I, 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 I agree with you. The question I answered was, where do we start? Yeah, I hear and, you. But I, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, I, and I, I mention this, I'll just say it out loud. We, too often, people think critical thinking is talking about critical race theory, which are two different things. Oh, sure. Um, and, and that's a ball of wax for another day. So who do we need the buy-in from, and how do we get it for that to happen in our educational institutions? David, Ben? You know, Jeff referred to the school boards. Um, you know, again, I kind of go back to that idea of comfort. Um, I think all of us have a responsibility to step up a little bit, and maybe even at kind of the micro local level, but to maybe attend a school board meeting and see what's happening in your district. And often those are open forums and you have the opportunity to at least express your opinion and ideas. Um, there'll probably be pushback on that. But I think we do need to take some responsibility ourselves to make even small steps and engage in our local communities, for instance, and to, to push back a little bit when we hear things that Jeff accurately describes are going on right now in a lot of school districts. Um, ben mentioned something um, that I think is important, this idea of peer pressure. And you know, you certainly see it in the House of Representatives uh, all the time um, right now. But the idea that a, a lot of people are afraid to kind of deport, depart from whatever the current official message is. And um, I think we need to provide safe places to provide alternatives. So there's an opportunity for people who are feeling this peer pressure, sometimes with the, with the kind of implicit threat of even violence, um, that they don't necessarily have to conform, that there are, there's a larger community here to which they can turn to support. And I don't think everybody always realizes that or is aware of that. So in terms of why isn't there critical thinking, this idea that there's intense peer pressure is, is really one reason that I think that the, I think does interfere with critical thinking. And, um, you know, we're in an air, we're 24 seven in ways we never were before in terms of information. I mean, there is so much information coming on so many different media sources that people are getting really overloaded with information. And so much is coming in that they don't pause to kind of analyze and think about it. It gets very superficial in terms of our evaluation of that. So you know, reminding people that, uh, yeah, we are getting a lot of information in ways we never did before. And maybe we've got to behave a little bit differently and step back and um, understand that we're getting overloaded and we need to um, be more evaluative. Um, than than we maybe are. So, um, you know, small steps I think are important. I think things that we do at the local level can have an impact. Um, that's at least one place to start. Yeah, and so I'm going to go back to that question because I think in some senses it's one of the hardest and maybe one of the most important. Ben, who do we need the buy-in from to that? for that to happen in our educational institutions and how do we get there? So, um, I, I think that uh, there is buy-in, believe it or not, by parents already. Parents want the best for their kids. What we're seeing in places like these school board meetings is basically a political game where people are sort of like what would I call astroturf parental groups that are pushing a certain agenda. You know, the all these books being banned at all these various places, right? It turns out that there's a few people working very hard to complain in all these places as opposed to some grassroots movement in the background. I think parents are really want their kids to do well on the whole, right? 
one of the things also I think that is important is um, I think there's been a kind of a push for at least 20 years to dumb us down, okay, to dumb down kids in terms of what they are actually do learning um, and therefore to have sort of a, a less literate uh, polity because you can take advantage of a less literate polity, okay? And so I think part of the effort that's here uh, is uh, to draw on those parents' desire for their kids uh, and, and encourage them to see things at the local level um, in, with more complexity, believe it or not, than what is being put forward to them as what is, quote, unquote, a good education. I want to emphasize that this effort uh, to sort of dumb us down is there's a class-based part of it, I do think, in terms of if you go to the very elite preparatory schools where all these folks want to, uh, are the sons and daughters of this and that, uh, they're being taught to think. They're being taught to think critically as part of what's there. They're not being dumped down. And they, they and 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 so, you know, this kind of I'm personally of the view that what would be really great is if we could reduce class sizes at every school, increase the number of teachers, and have students even as young as in maybe sixth or seventh grade. Um, participate in dialogue about appropriate level issues at at their age, to be able to hear their own voice, to to hear themselves think critically at whatever level. Um, just for the ADR types here, I remember when I was in uh, Texas, um, I got involved with a sort of a dispute resolution program for high schoolers. I think they were, or no, middle schoolers, where you know. Middle schoolers tend to react, you know, in the way that they do with, you know, violence or whatever about the disputes that arose. And there was an effort to teach them sort of how to mediate, to become these middle school mediators. And these students developed sets of skills from that particular kind of program, you know. And so that, that's where I have the hope or the, the optimism that there are ways if we... Uh, are concentrated on not dumbing down, but raising everyone. The last thing I would say is I just want to speak to language. I was just thinking uh, when when uh, Dave was speaking about the term deep fake, you know, and I was thinking, is it really a deep fake? It's more like a shallow reality, right? I mean, but we use the term deep fake, which has a whole connotation to it, right? You know? But is it's actually very shallow in a weird kind of way. You know what I mean? And it's kind of those kind of word games that we get caught up in um, or are played on our minds all the time is something that, you know, I, 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 I worry about sometimes. I, I... So we're about out of time. So we're going to take one quick round last words. <clears throat> Tina? Not I remain, with. Yes, I, I remain hopeful. I remain hopeful. The cynical side of me thinks of 1984 and the start where the society literally was dumbed down. You had Alpha, Beta, and Delta group. I'll leave it at that. So I'm going to remain hopeful that we do better. David? Yeah, I'm just going to defend the deep fake a little bit. Um, uh, it's deep in the sense that um, the, the technology is sophisticated and not even understandable to many of us. And I think that's what makes it deep um, in the sense that we don't, we can't really comprehend how this is being done. Um, all we can see is the result. But, um, but kind of a closing remark, I really want to thank Chuck Crompton for all the, all the think tech programs he's done. Um, yes. He's been a uh, a, a wonderful supporter of the program and critical thinking about critical dialogue and critical conversations. Chuck has been inspiring them now for maybe at least four years. Um, uh, I think everybody who's participated in these is grateful for what he's done, and uh, I know his audience is grateful also. Too kind. And shout out, 
to Jay Fidel for making this possible as well. Absolutely. And Michael and the, the rest of the technical team. I agree with you wholeheartedly, David. Yeah. <clears throat> Brother yeah. Jay Fidel, Haley, and Michael Agilinan. Jeff, last thoughts? I want to echo everybody's praise and thanks for all the people that have made these podcasts possible over the last four years on all kinds of topics, not just ours. My final thought on our topics is, sorry, Tina, but I don't see any reason to be optimistic. I don't see much has improved in the last four years. I think every single day brings more and more reasons not to be optimistic. I guess our society has made it through 250 plus years. I'm not sure based upon what happens in November, whether we'll get another 250, but uh, always want to be optimistic. But I, I would challenge folks to give me 10 reasons to be optimistic today, but this has been a great format, a great opportunity to do critical thinking. And hopefully the folks that have listened have, have gained something from our dialogue. So thanks to everybody again. Brother Ben. I just uh, wanted to say that uh, this, this opportunity to renew with old friends and uh, dialogue with new friends that we've had over these years uh, has been uh, really something that uh, I have greatly appreciated. Uh, and the, the way that uh, we have talked about many, many topics, I thought, is kind of an example of the kind of dialogue that is possible in our society, even though we have so many different views on different things. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I echo everyone else on the incredible work that Chuck has done and all the team there, Haley and, and Michael and the rest. And I just, uh, uh, want to speak to uh, the wonderful love of ideas that the people here have expressed at the various programs that we've done. You know, the, the, that's a special thing, is to actually engage with and love ideas and uh, work with them. And that's been always something that's been a pleasure for me, either when I'm in one of these or when I watch it on YouTube from someone I wasn't on. I always have learned something from what's going on here. And I, I thank you all for everything that you've done. Hey, and I'm going to wrap us up with a couple of things. One is the thanks to the panelists who really are the lifeblood and the heart of these sessions that Ben, Tina, David, Jeff, and so many others over the years, Sandra Sims, Rebecca Ratliff, David Louie, Doug Chin, <clears throat> Lots and lots of just absolutely wonderful people. Hey, and one last thing. I've had the incredible good luck the last two weeks to spend eight classes over an hour each with one private school group and seven public school groups of ninth through 12th grade high school students. That's my ground for optimism. I will put these kids up with anyone, no matter how divisive, no matter how destructive, no matter how threatening. But I'll put them up together, not individually. And my money is on the kids. The people who are our hope are the people who I believe can be. Believe in them, support them, respect them, honor them, and serve them. That's our hope. Think Tech Hawaii, thank you. Aloha. We hope you've enjoyed it, and we hope to be able to return and be with you again in the future. Take care, be well.
Aloha. We want to announce that ThinkTech Hawaii is moving into a new phase and will not be producing regular talk shows after April 30th. We will retain our website and YouTube channel and will accept new content on an ad hoc basis. We are also developing a legacy archive program to provide continuing public access to our content. If you can help us cover the costs of the transition and the development of our legacy archive program, please make a donation on thinktechaway.com. Thanks so much. Aloha.